Hello, everyone, and welcome to Why We Lead. My name's uh, Christopher Little. I'm here, very honored to be here with uh, Mr. David Deptula, retired Lieutenant General. Uh, so, sir, thank you for being here. Hey, great to be here, Christopher. Uh, I just want to give a brief intro and then give a little plug like we talked about about the Mitchell Institute as well so people can get to know a little bit more about that. So uh, you are uh, Dean of the Mitchell Institute for Aerospace Studies. Uh, you've planned, flown in, and commanded air operations ranging in humanitarian relief efforts to contingencies to major theater war. Uh, you served as the principal air attack planner for Operation Desert Storm in 1991 joint task force commander in Iraq overseeing Operation Northern Watch and led the initial air campaign of Operation Enduring Freedom or OEF as director of the Combined Air Operations Center. You served in active duty for 34 years, including your last assignment as the Air Force's Deputy Chief of Staff for ISR or Intelligence Surveillance and Reconnaissance. Additionally, you're a prolific writer, author, commentator on modern military strategy, operations, defense, and aerospace power. And with that being said, I want to kind of talk about what we mentioned earlier, Dean of the Mitchell Institute, and I want to let people know a little bit more about that. So the Mitchell Institute uh, for Aerospace Studies is an independent, nonpartisan poly re policy research institute established to promote understanding of the national security advantages of exploiting the domains of air, space, and cyberspace. It, you all have three goals, to educate the public about the advantages of aerospace power and achieving America's global interests, to inform key decision makers about the policy options created by exploiting the domains of airspace and cyberspace, and the importance of necessary investment to keep America the world's premier aerospace nation. And lastly, to cultivate the future policy leaders to understand the advantages of operating in airspace and cyberspace. And the Mitchell Institute maintains a policy of not advocating for a specific proprietary system or specific companies in its research or study efforts. So I think that's much appreciated as well. So sir, like I said, it's an honor to have you on here. And today we're going to be doing a little discussion about just RPAs uh, in general, the 18X career field and kind of the culture and where it's going next and talk a little bit about the past as well. So, sir, how do you think current RPA culture is changing from an airport Air Force perspective, particularly uh, the 18X career field? Yeah, well, thanks for the kind introduction, uh, Christopher. One of the things that are very pertinent to this discussion um, that uh, uh, I would also add to that is uh, during my time as a, a chief of Air Force Intelligence Surveillance and Reconnaissance, um, I worked uh, very hard and succeeded in getting the chief of staff from shifting um, the policy responsibility for remotely piloted aircraft from the deputy chief of staff op for operations over to uh, my portfolio, because I believe very, very strongly uh, that remotely piloted aircraft uh, need to be viewed and treated in the context of the entirety of the system, not just that piece of fiberglass up there flying around in the sky that hosts a bunch of sensors uh, and later weapons, <clears throat> but also the distribution mechanism for the information that's collected, um, as well as um, the backbone of the entire system and that's the analysts that translate the data that's collected into information that becomes valuable in providing uh, uh, the context for decisions that are made by our uh, Air Force and Joint Force leaders. Um, so, uh, you know, the overseeing the rapid growth in the numbers of remotely piloted aircraft, actually I oversaw an over a thousand percent increase in the number of RPA orbits from when I took over that position in uh, 2006 to when I departed in 2010. Uh, but also I'm the guy who initiated the stand-up of the RPA career field. Um, so uh, Thank you for that. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, I, I could talk a long time about some of the misperceptions that existed uh, in some of the original <clears throat> personnel uh, 
policies that were designed that kind of went off track. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think to, to directly get back to the answer to your question, um, I think that the current RPA culture uh, has really uh, evolved in the Air Force from where it was uh, in the you know first decade of the 21st century to today. Uh, mainly that there is a much greater realization for the potential um, uh, of remotely potted aircraft, not just from a intelligence surveillance or reconnaissance perspective, uh, but you know the perspective of being able uh, to uh, combine essentially all the elements of the kill chain into one platform. Uh, people tend not to think about it in this level of detail, uh, but prior to the introduction of weapons on board uh, the MQ-1 and then later the MQ-9, um, we, we had to rely on multiple different systems uh, to do the surveillance reconnaissance, then pass that information system to a bunch of analysts who then translated it into targetable coordinates who then pass that on to a bunch of planners um, who put that into an ATO and assigned it to some strike aircraft. Mm -hmm. And you can just understand um, all the different linkages and planning requirements and time that goes by between observation and uh, application of lethal force where you know, the magic of combining the fine, fix, and finish mm -hmm. elements of the kill chain into a, a remotely potted aircraft truly was revolutionary. It's not that the technology was revolutionary. I mean, shoot, we've been flying um, uh, unmanned aerial vehicles since 1911. Yes, sir. Uh, it, it's, that's not new. The technology's not cosmic but it is this combination of these different elements uh, into a single platform that really became revolutionary. And I think, back to your question, uh, the, the realization of that potential and then the incorporation of uh, remotely potted aircraft as key elements of the conflicts in Iraq, Afghanistan, and later Syria um, really have uh, 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 gotten people to realize that um, remotely piloted aircraft have become an essential part of uh, our military form of operations. Now, I think it's also important to understand that while the RPA has introduced um, a revolutionary consolidation of the kill cycle, um, that you know, there are some people that talk about drone wars. Um, I would tell you there's no such thing as a drone war. It's just like you hear today people talk about a space war. Yes, sir. There's no such thing as a space. <laughs> there's war, elements of which will occur in space. Mm -hmm. There's war of which elements will be conducted by remotely potted aircraft. These are tools that will facilitate the execution of conflict but they won't occur uh, singularly or only amongst themselves or only in one domain. Uh, but the bottom line is, I think the RPA community uh, has evolved to the point where that culture um, has inculcated all aspects of uh, Air Force operations. Well, thank you for that uh, candid response, sir. And I, I wanna go back and talk a little bit more about before the past decade uh, a little bit when there was another revolution in the Air Force, quote unquote revolution. But uh, in regards to Air Force cultural organizational revolutions, do you think you'll we'll ever see a situation like Vietnam where, I know you're a fighter person, but fighters overtook bombers. Uh, do you ever see that kind of situation happening with RPAs overtaking fighters in the future, whether it be by numbers or something along those lines? Well, um, first, 
um, I would suggest to you, Christopher, that there's there are a couple of misperceptions in, in the basis of your question. Yes, sir. What I tell you is fighters didn't overtake bombers. They became more relevant to the national defense strategy of the day mm -hmm. uh, and therefore um, it rose in uh, uh, interest. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and second, um, you know, when, when you had shared your uh, 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 question with me earlier, you, you talked about SAC being overtaken by TAC. SAC, yes, by the way, I have to explain to that to the, to the audience. <laughs> Strategic <because> Air Command. <laughs> some people don't even understand what SAC stood for, what it was. Um, Strategic Air Command and, and TAC was Tactical Air Command. Mm -hmm. um, you, you, SAC wasn't really overtaken by TAC. There was a realization um, when those organizations were changed, both of them, I would, I would re um, remind you, there's a realization that there's no such thing. I mean, uh, this is a subject that's near and dear to my heart because I've talked about it for a long time. Um, those were erroneously named commands because there's no such thing as a strategic aircraft or a tactical aircraft. The term strategic and tactical apply to outcomes, mm -hmm. you know, not, uh, not, not things. Um, <clears throat> you know, an example I like to use is B-52s were used for close air support in Vietnam. Uh, and an F-16 uh, in uh, Operation Iraqi Freedom uh, killed one of the, the most uh, 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 important leaders of uh, the revolution um, at the time. Uh, and that was a strategic action. So it's the outcomes that are either strategic or tactical, not the airplane. So Air Combat Command, mm -hmm. um, not named after a thing, uh, but a function, yes, sir. Was stood up to encompass the variety of things that should be put together. And, and I think what you're going to see in the not too distant future is a relook at some of the organizational commands in the Air Force and see a much more functional organization um, than we have today. But the, the essence of your question in the context of, hey, are we going to see RPAs over the <laughs> fighters? I hope that set the stage for my answer because it's not a matter of one system overtaking another system. It's a matter of how do these new capabilities fit into the context of our national security strategies, and how can they allow us to capitalize on the advantages of air and space power operating in the third dimension mm -hmm. uh, to meet our joint force advantages? So I, I hope that answers your question. It does, and thank you for that uh, well thought out message. Uh, organizational revolution might be a little bit of a, a little too much for that, but thank you for clarifying that. So, um, Let's shift gears a little bit to a little bit more present time, but uh, I read your uh, paper with some other people on mosaic warfare, and I, I love the concept. Uh, it's revolutionary, I think, to say the least, but um, it was very eye-opening. Uh, it made me contemplate a lot of things that I really hadn't thought about before, and especially in today's times when we talk about ABMS and JADC2 and everything and making everything kind of a node, uh, I thought this would uh, be a pretty good question to ask. But from a, a RPA perspective, how do you think um, high altitude aircraft or even MQ-9 uh, based off of sensor suite capabilities and range will play into uh, making mosaic warfare uh, possible in the near future? Yeah, well, I think there'll be key elements, whether it's an MQ-9, RQ-4, uh, and uh, any other uh, <clears throat> uh, remotely potted aircraft that we have, have out there because of their ability, again, and one of their the key advantages of persistence and long endurance, mm -hmm. um, along with a variety of sensor suites that they carry, or as well as communication systems. I mean, um, the the, uh, 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 the the translators that are carried on board uh, 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 the uh, uh, Global Hawk. Mm -hmm. Um, are, are incredible in terms of enabling this whole notion of, of uh, uh, 
uh, what's the right word that I'm looking for, um, uh, distribution of capabilities across a wide range of nodes mm -hmm. to be able to put together a mosaic of different capabilities um, that are linked in a fashion that if you take one or two or more than that out, um, you've created a system that can rapidly reconstitute uh, and become self-healing in the process. So as we evolve into the future um, where uh, systems may be tailor-made in the context of what's behind Mosaic Warfare, um, RPAs um, will act as sort of the initial elements of capitalizing on that kind of a perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, Hope that you makes sense. It does, sir. Do you think range plays a huge role in that, or is it more kind of the sensor suite as you were talking about? Well, it's a combination of both. Um, range translates into, or I should put endurance translates into range. Mm -hmm. If you look at one of the most critical areas that our, our national security strategy has uh, elevated to the forefront, um, that is uh, operations uh, to counter um, uh, the uh, uh, aggressive aspirations of China. Um, you, you know, that that is an area where you're dealing with long ranges. Uh, and again, that's, an, that's a place where uh, systems like MQ-9, RQ-4 really play into nicely, uh, particularly given the limitations of a manned aircraft. Yes, sir. Um, Kind of along those same lines, and it doesn't have to be RQ-4 specific, it could be high altitude aircraft in general. Yeah. Um, how do you think, uh, you know, we kind of talked about a little bit, but particularly about ABMS um, and I, Mosaic Warfare, how is that going to fit in most effectively? And I want to kind of talk about it from a capabilities, uh, high altitude perspective, as opposed to maybe more the MQ-9 role. Sure. Well, um, you, I didn't mention it before, but you know, the, one of the things that Global Hawk's famous for is for carrying uh, bacon. Bacon mm -hmm. is the translator that allows multiple communications modalities, folks operating on different frequencies, different uh, bandwidths, uh, to be able to fuse that information, translate where these systems cannot talk to each other, and then redistribute it. Essentially, <laughs> What ABMS is, and Mosaic Warfare uh, at its heart is, mm -hmm. are means to achieve the ubiquitous and seamless exchange of information. So, uh, you know, a high altitude aircraft plays with long endurance, mm -hmm. plays very well into uh, accelerating the initial set steps to realize the vision that uh, Mosaic Warfare and ABMS uh, ultimately aspire to. Um, so, I mean, that, those are real world examples and probably the first steps that will be taken in incorporating current systems to make ABMS a reality. Do you see, uh, foresee Bacon uh, eventually, you know, shifting from CENTCOM to a PACOM AOR? Absolutely. Um, and, and translators like that need to become more and more ubiquitous. Um, one of the challenges that we have is we have a limited number of global hawks. We've got a limited number of those translators and we really need to reduce them in size and expense. Mm -hmm. And we need to proliferate them um, on systems, not just like the RQ4, but every tanker should have one every bomber should have one, every airlifter should have one, um, so that we can, again, back to the mosaic idea where you have uh, elements of each one of the key functions mm -hmm. uh, distributed across a wide array of airborne systems. That's a great example. I love the fact about the 135s and the C-17s and stuff to get them more involved with overall uh, architecture of mosaic warfare. Uh, well, really the culture, back to the first question on culture, when we're designing airplanes, you know, and I had this challenge back when I was still a three-star in active duty, 
Yes, sir. Trying to explain to the then chief of staff at the time that, hey, you ought to provide a reward or as part of the, the key performance parameters for next generation tanker, for next generation bomber, um, is size, weight, and power and additional XX space. Because these systems are going to last 20, 30, 40, maybe 50 years. You don't know today what kind of systems are going to be developed. And I, I want to use tankers as comm nodes. Mm -hmm. I'd like to have the ability to reach out to the entire force, all the airplanes with SATCOM. You know, this was one of my challenges as the director of the Air Operations Center during um, the initial stages of Enduring Freedom. Mm -hmm. I mean, we had an MQ-9 out there that we were watching, but I couldn't get the, <clears throat> the picture that the MQ-9 was displaying to us into the cockpit of the F-14 so the pilot could drop a bomb on a Taliban Corps commander's headquarters meeting. I had to basically um, do a talk on through multiple nodes of communications um, to the F-14 pilot using a map of Kabul to tell him to go to the traffic circle in Northwest Kabul, take the North exit, go up <laughs> three streets, hang a left, and it's the third house on the right. You know, we, we need to, I go back to ubiquitous and seamless connectivity and communications. Um, and that's what we're going to have to do in thinking about how we design aircraft. Not, oh, well, Dave, we really can't do that because it'll increase the cost of the airplane. Really, it's not about the individual airplane. It's about the desired end game and outcome that you want to achieve. It's a hell of a lot cheaper to design in the extra space today, which would have been 2007, 2008, um, than building your cheapest airplane and now having to do some sort of retrofit or not even be able to get the capability on board because it's not big enough to handle an additional system. So you, they're really, you know, slowly but surely the leadership of the Air Force is understanding this, but uh, fundamental culture change here in terms of how we view aircraft. I go back to aircraft or aircraft, they're not strategic or tactical or reconnaissance. You know, they're, they're flying C2 ISR, uh, bomber, fighter, uh, a translator craft. And, and what we need to be building is the most versatile kind of craft that we possibly can that can operate in contested airspace. Because we're going to value those kinds of airplanes for their ability to uh, detect and, and provide information back to the rest of the force. Yes, sir. And that's a really good segue, uh, particularly for OMS, the open mission systems, which Hopefully, uh, eventually, there is a culture shift a little bit more towards that, and I think there is. Uh, but the National Defense Strategy, I want to give you a little quote out of this, but platform electronics and software must be designed for routine replacement instead of static configurations that last more of a, than a decade. Uh, do you think currently RPAs uh, live up to electronic and hardware obsolescence, and will OMS and or ABMS and the overall mosaic warfare concept help with this issue? Well, first, the short answer to your question is um, the current crop of RPAs were specifically not designed um, to be able to rapidly change out systems. As a matter of fact, um, the reason that the Global Hawk um, uh, won the Collier Trophy back, I think it was 98, I actually yes, was at that. Um, uh, at that Collier presentation that is awesome. uh, of, the, of the award is because remember that the original specifications had nothing in terms of modularity involved. It was, you know, to be able to design this kind of an aircraft um, as cheap as possible, mm -hmm. which meant everything was hardwired into it. So, you know, the metrics that were set for the mission accomplishment were the exact opposite <laughs> of where we need to be today. Now, all of that said, um, industry has done a good job of modifying uh, and adapting both RQ4 and MQ9 to be able to accept uh, and, and live up to rapid change out of different kinds of systems. But that's gonna have to be integral into the next 
RPA, uh, and, and quite frankly, we're gonna, you know, I'm the guy that introduced RPA as, a, as terminology. It's now time that we have to start thinking about different terpeno terminology when we get to autonomy and autonomous systems because, and to a degree, Global Hawk is sort of there already. It's not really a remotely potted aircraft because as you well know, you monitor the systems, it's programmed to do something. You can intervene to change it, but it's still flying autonomously. Sure. Um, so we, we're, we're gonna have to change our terminology again. Uh, you know, pretty safe term to use are, uh, are UAVs because these things are unmanned aerial vehicles. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wanna back up just a little bit to when you um, had to advocate to change whatever nomenclature people used uh, earlier in the 2000s about RPAs. How uh, important was it from your level uh, for advocating for drones, UAVs, as it was, to associate the person? Uh, well, well that, that's, that's the whole reason, Christopher, mm -hmm. is the, the media had grabbed onto this term drone. Mm -hmm. Okay, now all of us have become sensitized to that, so it's not yes, a big deal. But at the time, it was pretty offensive. Because to military folks, drones are targets, mm -hmm. you, you, you know, and, and, and so, and, and the term became ubiquitous. So when you heard <laughs> a, 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 a reporter talk about drones, you didn't know whether he or she was talking about a four pound hand launched Raven um, or a, a, a Global Hawk, which is, you know, a wingspan of a 737. A, a drone's not a drone's not a drone, and, and then they were they were, they were painted as these amoral purveyors of death, and, and so drone conjured up a picture that was not reflective of the reality of the entire operation. Ergo, remotely piloted aircraft got across the notion, not the notion, the reality that there are people involved in uh, the, the operation of these aircraft, remotely potted aircraft. There's a pilot. Mm -hmm. They're just not in or sitting on uh, that conglomeration of fiberglass in the sky. Uh, and uh, I, I think it's been effective. We didn't try to, what I told the chief at the time is look, Here's what I propose we start doing is just start using the term remotely potted aircraft. Don't mandate it because if you make it an edict, uh, you know, thou, therefore everyone in the Air Force shall now use this term, they'll immediately be pushed back mm -hmm. uh, and it'll at look like it's been directed from it. No, just, just start using the term. And then when people ask about it, you can explain to them. You can explain to them, correct them when they use the term drone. Or Department of Defense had used this term unmanned aerial systems, well, which is a ridiculous term because there's absolutely nothing unmanned about the system. <laughs> there's the so system, many people involved. The system actually to keep uh, a line, a cap, whatever you orbit, whatever we want to call it nowadays, mm -hmm. airborne involves a hell of a lot more people than it does to keep an F-15E airborne, you, you, you know, so that was the other part of the notion. Mm -hmm. They're not unmanned uh, systems. The systems are, the aircraft are unmanned. Yes, sir. That's why I say, you know, words matter. And while some people say, wow, you're just dancing around semantics. Hey, words are important. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's why we evolved to use the term remotely potted aircraft. Awesome. Well, thank you for that explanation. I love the part about you didn't mandate it. And no, you know, that, no. that could relate to other things as well. Like if you mandate something, there's second and third order effects that maybe you haven't thought about, right. but right. Um, I, it obviously worked. We call it RPAs right. now and right. drones are, you know, that terminology is frowned on. So, well, it, you, know, you can understand, look, I, my media friends, I go, look, I, I get it. You guys, now, when you're doing an article, it's one word instead of three words, and you don't have to explain it. Mm -hmm. But you're conveying a, a, an improper understanding of what these aircraft and the systems that are involved with them actually do. Mm -hmm. 
Well, well they don't care. They're reporters. You, you know, they're you know, so. <laughs> clickbait. Yeah. So uh, we talked a little bit about um, the Pacific earlier and you used the aggressive. Uh, I love the, the terminology you used about uh, their very, how aggressive they're getting, quote unquote. But uh, per the national security strategy and the national defense strategy, they are our number one potential for conflict via long term strategic competition. Uh, as the UF shifts from a, our usual counterinsurgency operations, which I, I think personally have already seen in the Middle East, to a more strategic uh, engagement, particularly with China, how do you see with our limited arsenal of RPA capable of flying in that environment, uh, effectively engage in the air campaign in the Pacific, uh, in particular, along with that, maybe a two-part question, but in a denied environment like we alluded to a little bit earlier? Well, well we did talk about some of this a little bit earlier. Mm -hmm. um, there are problems with using uh, RQ4s and MQ9s in a, divide in a denied environment. It doesn't mean they can't be used mm -hmm. or conditions cannot be created for their use. But that's the whole essence of air campaign planning. Um, when you use them, um, what needs to be done to be able to insert them so that we can capitalize on their capabilities. Uh, but we talked a, a little bit earlier in terms of um, using some of the current systems as uh, distributing capabilities across mm -hmm. wide areas. Um, that can be done and that's some of the, the their potential that may be incorporated into uh, an air campaign in the Pacific. At the same time, the Air Force needs to be, and they are considering, considering you know, next generation aircraft and the, the ability to operate in denied environments uh, play very critically into uh, the design considerations as we move forward. So there, there is utility to the current systems that we have, but they have to be carefully managed um, so we don't put them into a threat environment where they're extraordinarily vulnerable. I mean, the Iranians shooting down the uh, uh, Block 10 Global Hawk, although it was mm -hmm. a very, very early, uh, early capability, uh, it, it doesn't matter, it could have been a new one too. Uh, the issue wasn't what block it was. The issue was that, um, you know, it was, it was a very uh, uh, large system in terms of radar cross-section and uh, was a uh, uh, SAM bait for mm -hmm. any kind of surface-to-air missile system. Mm -hmm. So we got to be careful. Um, they can be used. Uh, and we need to put this into the equation as we build new uh, uh, UAVs into the future. Awesome. Um, and we, we, I want to talk a little bit about, we, we already talked a little bit about high altitude ISR, but where do you see the future just for I, high altitude ISR in general, not just with RPAs? Like, well, is that there's always, I mean, you know, <laughs> high altitude means what? Uh, a, a breadth of perspective than you otherwise would not have at lower altitude. Mm -hmm. It's just a matter of physics. So uh, the demand for, uh, and in particularly when we talk about uh, space-based systems becoming more and more vulnerable, mm -hmm. um, there is an argument to be made for increasing the diversity of uh, in numbers of in atmospheric systems that can operate at high altitude um, as part of the domain awareness portfolio of the United States Air Force. So I think there's a, a you know, there, there will be continued demand to operate in that, in that arena. Thank you for that. And going forward with uh, RPA acquisition and how we go about, um, you know, buying RPA or giving them new capabilities, uh, what do you think is the, like, of the three I'm about to give you, what do you think are the three biggest, and I know it's situational based depending on uh, which uh, AOR we're in or whatever, but is it usually cost, politics, or capabilities that are the biggest driving factor for um, how RPAs uh, will be fielded in the future? 
Well, uh, the, the number one driver of those three that you laid out there is capabilities. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, metering of what is in the realm of the possible is the resources available piece. Mm -hmm. And to a lesser degree, um, the politics. The politics do not enter the equation from a military perspective, but from a national security perspective writ large, they certainly do. Um, it would be short-sighted not to recognize um, that the, the Congress of the United States are part and parcel uh, of our national security architecture because they're the ones um, that provide the money allow us to develop the capability. So generally the military comes up with the capability piece, um, uh, provide a, a wedge um, or a spot in the program objective memorandum, uh, the, the Air Force budget uh, that's sent over to Capitol Hill. And then the politics come into play in terms of the hearings that were held, are held to determine the relevance uh, and the relative attributes of you know, the RPAs as part of the system uh, in the context of the entire military budget. So all three pieces play a role. Mm -hmm. um, again, I'd rank them capabilities, resources, and politics in that order. But they're a little bit like three legs of a stool. Um, if you don't have support of one, uh, the whole thing doesn't work. Yes, sir. So, um, you, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to uh, to say one's more important than the other. Awesome, sir. Well, that's about all, all the questions I have for today. Is there anything else you'd like to say about uh, the topic or? Well, I think that um, you, you raised some excellent questions and I hope that uh, my perspectives uh, 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 illuminate some of the, the thought processes that uh, may either have already existed uh, and uh, instructed them and, and maybe shape some of the capabilities for the future. Uh, but um, remotely piloted aircraft, unmanned aerial vehicles, autonomy, artificial intelligence, these are all elements that will combine together to provide greater and greater capability as the Air Force evolves uh, into the future. So thanks again for the opportunity to chat with you and uh, wish you all the best. Thank you, sir, for your time.